Good evening. I'm glad to be up here tonight. As Trish said, my name is Laura Trevat. I'm part of the family here. And it's great because we are family. We come from all walks, different churches, different communities, but we all have Jesus in common. And that makes us family, which is pretty awesome. So tonight my message is what I've learned from Merrill about our place in the kingdom. But before I um, start on the teaching, I'd like to just offer up a prayer. So Father, I thank you for eyes to see, for ears to hear, for a heart to love, for a mind to understand. And Father, I just ask tonight that you open up our hearts and our minds and Lord, speak to us. And Father, I just ask that you use me as a vessel. May what I say glorify you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So I will give a disclaimer before I start. So for those of you that are not cat lovers or hate cats or don't like cats, please bear with me for a minute because I have an illustration. But uh, that's my disclaimer. So don't tune me out if you don't like cats because that's not the whole point of the message. And Dave Jones is going to love this because he's heard a little bit of the story before. My uh, key scripture tonight is 2 Timothy 1.9. I took the word God from the 8th verse to make a complete sentence. God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. So I want to share a little story with you. Uh, last fall, I came up from work one day, and my husband James said, we got a little problem. We've got a feral cat that has kittens in our outdoor storage area. So I said, oh, no, we don't have cats. And a cat and kittens in there. So I opened the door to the storage, and there was no cat. There were no kittens. James said, they're in there. She's just taught them how to hide. So I put out some food and water. Food and water disappeared. But still, you'd open the doors to the storage, no cat, no kittens. So James said, I'll, I'll fix this. I'll put a camera in, and I'll put a mo <laughs> If anybody knows James, you'll love this. Because in our house, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. <laughs> so James said, I'll put a camera in the storage area, but not a camera we have to watch 24-7. I'll put a motion sensor camera. So only when they move will it record. So there began our fall videos at night. So I'd come home from work and I'd say, what happened today? And we'd go down to the computer and turn the camera on. And 10 times they were out moving around. And we watched them in little fur balls rolling around. And it was so cute. And the mom protective of them and teaching them how to do things. And then it got up to where 25 times a day they were moving around because the kittens were growing. And the mom started teaching them how to jump on things. And so it was great. Well, then I come home one day from work, and James said, we got a problem. We have a raccoon invasion. Not only had a raccoon figured out how to get into the shed, but if you know anything about raccoons, they love to invite their family in. So not did we only just have one raccoon, we had two raccoons that found their way into the shed because there was dry food in there. And these are actually quite large raccoons because the mom, the feral, was about six pounds. But she, we saw them on the camera. The, the mom was whacking the raccoons, keeping them away from the kittens. But we knew we had a problem with raccoons, so we put a raccoon relocation program in place. <laughs> and we trapped the raccoons, and um, we decided that they needed to be taken far, far away so they wouldn't come back. So I won't tell you where in Cobb County we took them, but just... <laughs> Suffice it to say, we had a relocation program. But we also knew that the kittens were growing, and the mom was going to teach them how to get out of the storage. And they would be a great appetizer to the wildlife that is in the woods behind our home. So we knew that it was time to trap the kittens. And we found someone that would foster them so that they could be domesticated to be adopted. But <clears throat> once you trap the kittens and the, mo and the mom's no longer nursing, she then goes into heat. So we knew that we couldn't have this repetitive cycle of more kittens. So we knew once we trapped the kittens, we had to trap the mom. So 
We apprehended the feral. Doesn't she look happy? <laughs> Just thrilled to be trapped. So I called our vet and said, Dr. Tubbs, if we can trap this feral, would you neuter her? Because some vets won't take ferals because they don't know if they're diseased and they don't want to contain, if they don't have a uh, uh, area to contain them in their practice, they won't bring them. And Dr. Tubbs said, yes, if you'll catch her, we will neuter her. And in the world of ferals, there is a, a very gentle practice called trap, neuter, and release. So you do just this so that they stop reproducing. So he said, yes, we will, we will take care of neutering her. So we were so excited. We trapped her on a Saturday morning. I called Dr. Tubbs. I said, Dr. Tubbs, we got her. We got the feral. He said, Laura, that's great, but we close at noon on Saturday, and I don't do any surgery on Saturday. And I said, well, you know what? Feral is going to have a spa weekend. At your, at your vet, because we, at your office, because we are not letting her go, I don't know that we'll catch her again, because cats are smart, and once the kittens were gone, I'm not sure she'd come back in. So she had a lovely spa weekend, and I never told James how much that cost, <laughs> but on Monday, she had surgery, we go and pick her up, and the vet said, well, here's the good news, there are two kinds of ferals. They're fearful ferals and they're mean ferals. And this one is a fearful feral. And she has worms, which isn't unusual for outdoor cats. So you need to give her a pill for 10 days. <laughs> and I said, Dr. Tubbs, I don't care that she's fearful or mean. I'm not giving her a pill. He said, OK, then I'll give you powder. And you just need to sprinkle it on food. Now, by this time, it was January. So I said to James, OK, so what we'll do, let's bring her home. We'll put her in your office. <laughs> for 10 days while we give her the food, and then we'll let her out. So 10 days went by. We put her in the office. Now let me tell you a thing that's interesting with this whole trap new to release program, OK? The vet does what's called tipping, OK? Tipping is a universal sign of a feral cat. So if you can see her cute little left ear is not symmetrical, the vet tips the end because this is, an, and it's while they're under anesthesia, so it doesn't hurt her. But this is the universal sign so it's visible when you see ferals in the wild that they have been trapped and neutered, which is a good thing, right? And you know they can't reproduce. So she's been tipped. So she's got a tipped ear so you can easily see that she's been neutered. Isn't she cute? So the 10 days go by. A month goes by. Two months goes by. The, the sign on the door to James's office says, do not open, feral inside. Okay. But uh, a friend of ours said, you know, you really need to stop calling her a feral. Look at this identity you're giving her, calling her a feral. You really need to give her a name. So we decided to name her Meryl Feral. So she went from feral to Meryl, but she now has a new name. So we decided it was time to expand her territory. And by the way, we're on about month three. And so I think Meryl is going to become an indoor cat. So we decided let's expand her territory. So we opened up the office door and gave her room to roam around a little bit more downstairs. She hid under James's desk. You can see the legs of the chair there. We expanded her territory, but she hid. She didn't go out, take the territory, explore. So I said, God, this makes no sense. Look, we've given her food. We've given her warmth. She's safe. We've expanded. We've given her a name. We've expanded her territory. This makes no sense. And God said, now you see how I feel. He said, do you know what? You were the feral. I said, what? God said, you were the feral. 2 Timothy 1.9. God said, I heard you, your cry. I lifted you out of the pit, out of the miry clay. Put your feet upon a rock. God saved me when I called out to him. And he didn't just save me. God called me. And as Paul says, he called with a holy calling. If you're saved, you're called. 
How many of you know that you're saved? How many of you know that you're called? How many of you are walking in that calling? Because I will tell you that if you were saved, you were called. And if you're not walking in your calling, you will never be satisfied. And you know, many Christians don't even know what their calling is, this holy calling. But I will tell you that this calling is more valuable than any earthly treasure. God showed me when I was in graduate school what my calling was. And my calling was to go into the marketplace and to help others get into their position, align their skills and their love with a job that they could really invest in and excel at. And for over 30 years, I will tell you that as long as I was walking in my calling in the business world, doors opened. When I wasn't in my calling, doors closed. I will tell you, if you're saved, you're called, and you will never be satisfied until you're walking in your calling. We're marked and set apart. Just like Merrill has a tipped ear, we're marked. And we're marked with the blood of Jesus. You can see the ferals who have been neutered and released. You can see them at a distance because the tip of their ear is missing. Can people see Jesus in us at a distance? Can they see that we're marked with the blood of Jesus? Or do they have to get close to us to see it? But we're marked and set apart. God has a divine plan and purpose. And thank goodness, it is not according to our works. <clears throat> Pharaoh was trapped, was brought in the house, was given a new name, not because she deserved it, not because of her works, but because there was a plan even for this cat's life. I'm the youngest of four in my family. I've got two older siblings that are 10 years older than I am. And as older siblings, they were really the leaders in the household. And I wasn't a natural leader in the family. But I'll tell you, God's calling on us is not dependent upon our abilities. Because it's where our abilities end that grace begins. Let me say that again. It's where our abilities end that grace begins. Because you know what? If it was by our own abilities that we could do it, then we wouldn't need Jesus. But it's where our abilities end that grace begins. And that's where it's important to be in God's calling for our life, God's purpose, not our own. You know, one of the biggest problems in our society is low self-esteem. And you can see it when there's fear and doubt and worry. But do you know as Christians, we, we shouldn't have low self-esteem. And do you know why we shouldn't have low self-esteem? Because we should know what we're worth to the kingdom. James and I had a car that um, we decided we were going to sell in December, so we looked up the blue book value to see what it was worth, and it said between four and five thousand dollars. But do you know what that car was worth? It was worth what somebody was willing to pay for it, right? That's really what it was worth. And do you know what you're worth? You're worth what God was willing to pay for you. And do you know what God paid for all of us, each of us, for you? That is what you're worth to the kingdom. That is why we as believers, and you raised your hand when I said, are you saved? If we're saved and we're believers, then our self-esteem should be never low because of our worth to the kingdom, because of what we're worth to God. New identity, not according to our works, thank goodness. God wants us to know our purpose according to his plan. He takes away, just like he did for Meryl, takes away our identity as ferals. We were feral. We were wild. Do you know the life of a feral is zero to two years? They don't live long. Our life as sinners 
is short because we don't have eternal life. God takes away our identity as a feral and gives us a new identity and a new name. And we don't have to decide what our purpose is. What we have to do is find out what good works God has prepared for us. I will tell you, you will never be satisfied until you're walking in your calling. Because if you struggle with regret or restlessness or disappointment or depression, it's because you're not in your calling. Even if you know your calling, we can fall out of our calling because we can choose not to walk in it. But I can tell you God wants each one of you to bear fruit that will endure for eternity. And the only way we bear the fruit that God has called us to bear is walking in our purpose. God wants to expand your territory. Many of us ask for God to expand our territory. There's even a prayer, right? Lord, expand my territory. And God does. He will expand our territory if we ask. But you know what God says? I expand your territory and then you hide into the desk. You don't take the land I gave you. And I will tell you, for many of us, God will expand our territory even when we don't ask because He has a territory for you to take. And He knows you'll never ask for it. But God is expanding your territory in order for you to fill your pur purpose. So let me ask you this. What happens when we wake up and say, God, how did I end up here? You know, this isn't where I thought I would be in my 20s or my 30s or my 40s, or you fill in the blank, whatever the year is or the decade is. What happens when we wake up here and, and we don't know what happened? We don't know how to A, find our purpose or get back into our purpose. So I want to give you a, a simple way, and we'll close with this, but how do you find your purpose? If you know your purpose, how do you reconnect with your purpose? And we're going to go to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. So let me walk you through this, and then I'll close, because I think it's important. Romans 12, chapter 1, a living sacrifice. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. What you do with your body or your temple determines your success in life. What you do with your body determines your success in life. Because we are to be a living sacrifice. Remember, it is not our works that justify us but it is giving ourselves as a living sacrifice. And a living sacrifice means we're giving who we are. So as Romans 1 says, a living sacrifice, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. But let me tell you something, the sacrifice does not make you holy. The altar makes you holy. Paul said our calling is a holy calling. So in order to walk in our calling, it must become a holy calling. In order for it to become a holy calling, we have to give our all. We have to give ourselves as a living sacrifice and say, God, I'm all in. If I'm going to walk in this calling, if I'm going to fulfill what you've called me to do, Lord, then I give you my all. And that is giving ourselves as a living sacrifice. Many of us may have done things that were unpure, unholy, sinful. But once our identity changes, once we're saved, once we're called, then we can't do these things again. There are things I've done that I wished I hadn't done, but you know what? I give myself as a living sacrifice to the altar and the Lord makes me holy. Who gave the first living sacrifice? It was Jesus. God gave His only Son as a living sacrifice. So what is the least that we can do for God? God has a purpose for you. And in order to find that purpose or to walk in that purpose again, 
You've got to give yourself as a living sacrifice. Number two, Romans 2, 12, verse 2, renewing your mind. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When we submit our bodies as a living sacrifice on the altar, we're also, we're also sacrificing our mind. We've submitted our mind. We, thank goodness, cannot renew our minds. God renews our minds. But it's only in giving ourselves as a living sacrifice that we allow him to re renew our minds. The world teaches us to ask, what's in it for me? There's even an acronym for that. It's called WIFM. What's in it for me? In the business world, you see it all the time. You're negotiating a deal. Well, what's in it for us? What's in it for me? What's in it for our company? And if we're asking what's in it for us, then we don't have a renewed mind. It's only when we ask what's in it for God that we know he has renewed our mind. But do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. So you ask, how do I find out what God's will is for me? Give your body as a living sacrifice and renew your mind. Because only when your mind is renewed are you able to test and know what God's will is. Let's move on to verse 3. Humility. For by, by the grace given to me, I say to each one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Now here's the great thing about a renewed mind. Once your, once your mind is renewed, your mind becomes a realist. Your mind becomes a realist. We start where we are and ask God to show us what he wants us to do right where we are. When we know our value, we are humble. What are we worth to the kingdom? We're worth what God was willing to pay. What was God willing to pay? The sacrifice of his son. Therefore, that is our righteousness. There should be humility in that. When we know our value, we can be humble. Why did Lucifer fall? Because of pride. What is pride? Pride's the opposite of humility. The greatest deceit of the enemy is pride. And if we become self-righteous and prideful, if we start looking at whiffum, what's in it for me, then we can't receive the glory of the Lord. But the greatest, the greatest weapon of the enemy is pride. If the enemy can get us to be self-righteous or prideful, then I'm telling you, we fall out from under the will of the Lord and the purpose he has for us. Humility is step three. Four, finding your place in the body. For just as each of us has one body and many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, each member belongs to all the others. In order to find your calling and your fulfillment, you have to find your place in the body. God did not design us to be alone. He designed us to be part of the body, part of the family, to be accountable to each other. We're individuals but if we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, renew our minds, walk in humility, then we will find our place. You've probably heard the story of the bricklayers, of a man that walked up to a bricklayer and said, what are you doing? And the bricklayer said, well, I'm laying brick. So he walked down the line and walked to the next one and said, what are you doing? And the bricklayer said, I'm building a cathedral. <clears throat> We find our place in the body. For like the bricklayer, building the cathedral, we all have a part in the body in building that cathedral. And finally, Romans 12, verse 6 through 8, find your charisma. These are your different gifts, and we all have different gifts. You know, often we think of charisma, we think of that charismatic person, we say, oh, they light up the room when they walk in, they've got charisma. But do you know the definition of charisma is a divine conferred power or talent? The charismatic gifts are the expressions of God's gift to us. 
Remember where grace begins? Where ability ends. When you function in the gift that God has given you, you will be charismatic. If you're walking in the gift God has given you, by definition, you will have charisma. You can be an intercessor and have charisma. You can have the gift of hospitality and have charisma. Charisma is a divinely conferred power or gift. So steps to finding your place in the kingdom. Giving ourselves as a living sacrifice. Be transformed and renew your mind. Walk in humility. Find your place in the body. And find your charisma. From Farrell to Merrill, God has saved us. And God has a calling for us. What I learned from Merrill about our place in the kingdom. Father, I thank you tonight for your man of heaven. Father, I thank you for using me as a vessel. And tonight, Father, I pray that we as the body and we as the individuals, if we're not walking in the purpose you've called us to, Father, that we will draw near to you and you will draw near to us and realign us in the purpose so that we may bear eternal fruit. In Jesus' name.